evening, everyone. I'm a little too short to see the clock here, so I might have to <laughs> fidget just a little bit. Um, but welcome, and we're very excited to start talking tonight about seeking the peace of the city. Um, I don't know how much time you've had to look at our program book. I don't know if you're one of the types that reads the whole thing from cover to cover right when you get here, but there's an awful lot of information in there. And I, I wanted to point out just some really great wording that's in there, and I'm actually just going to read a couple of paragraphs for you that try to start talking about what shalom means. You know, our theme is seeking the peace of the city. We didn't actually say seeking the shalom of the city, but that's really what we want to talk about. So let me just read a couple of paragraphs for you, and you can really take a deeper look at it again later. When God created the heavens and the earth, he wove it all together like a million silk threads forming a dazzling garment never before seen, each thread passing over, under, and around millions of others to create a perfectly complementary, tightly woven, interdependent, amazing whole. This wondrous webbing together of God and man and all of creation is what the Hebrew prophets called shalom. Shalom is a word packed with hope for a broken, bruised, and wounded world. It speaks of wholeness, right relationships, justice, salvation, and righteousness, all of which can be missed when we simply read the English word peace. So I've been given the assignment to help us unpack shalom. So as I've been reflecting a little bit on this assignment, I've thought about how I kind of thought I understood this stuff, shalom, and was doing a pretty decent job of implementing it in my community development, organizing, advocacy, and public policy career, and neighborhood volunteerism. I've been a Christian since I was a little girl, uh, but it was for me in my mid-20s, after graduate school in urban planning, that I experienced my most significant, what I call, aha moment in my understanding of the concept of shalom. I think I kind of, before then, kind of got it in my gut, and I had always appreciated those Catholic posters that said, if you want peace, seek justice. Um, and I had probably already received some training and teaching on it, maybe even here at a CCDA workshop. Um, but it was a book by World Vision's Bruce Bradshaw, entitled Bridging the Gap, Evangelism, Development, and Shalom, that really empowered me to articulate shalom. Uh, I do remember having to read it at least two times before I fully grasped everything that he had to say, though. Um, so I personally continue to live in my lifelong barrio and have done affordable housing and community uh, development work most of my professional career and in my community volunteerism. And for a number of years recently, I was serving in a lay leadership role as community development coordinator of a CCDA church. Um, but a few years back, I had a personal crisis, which included my own flirtation, as I call it, with the edge of the cliff, kind of um, almost having a burnout experience. Um, and I realized that there wasn't much balance or wholeness in my own personal life. Um, and I realized how hard it was to struggle for justice and to promote the wholeness of other individuals and communities when I was less than whole. Um, then, after some time for personal reflection and rejuvenation, I met and married this guy who has discovered a deep interest in animal rights and environmental activism and an attraction to elements of cultures and religions that often do a better job than American-style Christianity does of celebrating God in nature and all of the elements of the universe and in being concerned for the stewardship of all creation. So I'm kind of back to thinking more deeply about wholeness and right relationships and justice and salvation and righteousness. Um, and then just recently, a, a friend of mine pointed out that he only recently learned about the depth and complexity of the concept of shalom. Um, so I just... I, I really think it's important that we really spend some time talking about that today, that it is really about more than just the English word peace. So I'm really excited to be here to help facilitate this conversation. And I'm going to ask you, Michael, to get us started in better understanding what shalom is. Thank you, Juanita. I think I also went through a process of journey and understanding what shalom is for us, as, and especially a people of faith. Um, let me revisit the Jeremiah passage that Coach already had contextualized for us in terms of people being taken against their will into a country and a place that they did not desire or seek. And here they were waiting for the promise to go back home. Um, promise to go back to that which was familiar, to that which would give them a sense of purpose and identity. Uh, but the word did not come that way to them. It was, as we heard, uh, to build houses, 
to plant gardens, and ultimately to seek the, the well-being, the welfare of the city, and then therefore find themselves their own sense of shalom. Um, I think they went through a, a process too, very similar to yours. One was to wake up with wi eyes wide open and realize that what they thought they would find in the Word of God was not what they heard. And they had to, I think, go through a, a process of repentance, uh, lament, to give up what they thought was about shalom to something new. And then something that was probably most unsettling for them and for certainly for many of us is that it was not leaving the context that they will find shalom, that is returning back to the promised land, to that which was familiar, that which would give them identity, because again, they were the chosen people, but was to find shalom in the transformation of the world in which they were living, which took it away from just the personal into something that was much more tangible uh, and certainly more challenging. Part of it was the physical environment, but also the civic and social infrastructure that was holding them captive. And I think there's a tension there that's really provocative, and I think we could explore later, mm -hmm. but certainly an invitation to join a conspiracy. And that conspiracy is to make this a better world for everyone. Great, so you talk about transformation. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Dr. Bernard, or as he said, I could call him AR. <laughs> Uh, you spoke last year about a holistic view of society and the church and how faith should permeate culture. And the establishment of your Christian Cultural Center is the embodiment of that mindset, I think. Um, so can you say a little bit about your perspective on transformation and your own process of moving from a focus on individual transformation to include uh, community transformation? I, I think the word process that you use is, is a critical word because... Transformation is, is a journey, and it comes for me out of uh, the beginning of my life was in brokenness. Uh, my father rejected me and my mother at birth. Mm -hmm. So she went through the first you know, four years of my life uh, depressed and uh, feeling rejected and, and a lost sense of identity. And because of how much she gave up uh, to, to keep me and, and, and not abort me. Uh, it was in that beginning of brokenness that, that my journey began because it continued when we came to, to, the, to the United States where she uh, lied to me about what happened, how it happened to protect me and her own heart. So I spent the growing up in the 60s and, 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 and early 70s, trying to resolve my own identity crisis. So I was broken, and in a society that was racially and socially broken, and I was trying to find the meaning of wholeness and, and, and peace, which took me through various religious expressions, and ultimately landing me uh, in the nation of Islam, which gave me a sense of Dignity as, as a young person of color growing up in an urban environment in New York City, uh, order and discipline. Uh, I still didn't find God there, but it was a movement towards that sense of wholeness. And then finally in 1975, through a uh, guy named Nicky Cruz who brought me to the Lord, um, I experienced that personal wholeness, but now felt the need to take that personal wholeness that I've now discovered and bring it back to that broken society, because I believe the societal brokenness begins with individual brokenness. And that began a journey of trying to understand Christ's relationship to the broken culture, you know? And um, that was an interesting journey because, you know, I, I found that the church occupied two extremes, one of isolation or imitation of the culture, when we should have been practicing more insulation and penetration of the culture. So, you know, when we have 
culture, like one person says, holding us as the ocean holds the fish, we have to know how to navigate because it's not something that we can escape from. We're breathing in it. We're living in it. And I love that illustration of fish because you could have saltwater fish or fish in salt water and they're not salty. So we can insulate ourselves, adjust to the culture, and then impact it. So it's my own personal brokenness, brokenness that needed to be resolved. And then I had a responsibility to deal with the brokenness of the society in which I found myself. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add anything to that? Well, the, the mention of wholeness is really important here. And again, I'm hearing the, the aspect of context, and you talked about the culture in which we find ourselves, um, the brokenness that's found and experienced not only personally, but in terms of our society and our communities. Um, the other dimension of shalom that I think the people in Babylon experienced or came to understanding is that is not the absence of conflict or struggle. It was certainly there, and I hear that in your story. But it's knowing and acknowledging that it's in that midst of that pain and brokenness that we find and find that shalom in knowing that God is with us. Um, and, and it's that very tangible understanding that permeates ourselves in order that we can infiltrate, if you will, the culture and transform it. But it's, it's not, the, again, the, the, the tranquility that we sometimes um, you know, impose upon shalom. It's, it's, I think it's inclusive of that. But it's much more knowing that it's in the, this tension that there's internal struggle, and yet the sense of rootedness and not in acknowledging that God is with us. Mm -hmm. So would you tell us uh, a little bit more about your church and what is it doing to infiltrate? <laughs> Penetrate, infiltrate, yeah. piercing yeah. the darkness. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like what you said uh, about um, that that, that wholeness and that healing taking place internally within the individual um, because I, I discovered that wholeness or shalom is not the absence of conflict, mm -hmm. but it is a way in which we resolve conflict that leads to health, mm. whether it's in my personal life or even in the life of our church as community. So a healthy church is not a church absent conflict. It is a church, uh, it, what makes that church healthy is how it resolves yes. the conflicts that are inevitable right. amongst people. So our church went through a, peep, uh, a period of moving from what, what M. Scott Peck calls pseudo or false community <laughs> to the process of of engaging the conflict, uh, having a way that, that speaks of shalom to resolve conflict and then move into community. Mm -hmm. And then take that sense of community experience out into the broken world that's outside of us. Mm -hmm. the, the little paragraph in, in the book, in your program book that I talked about, there, there's another piece that talks about uh, this specifically, and maybe you can just say a little bit more about kind of the work that you've done in your communities, and, and does it look anything like this? God's intention for every community is that his shalom would reign. Can you imagine neighborhoods with secure streets, healthy relationships, effective and affirming schools, clean air, and a thriving local economy? Can you picture neighbors sharing meals together, children laughing and playing freely, and the elderly being valued, honored, and cared for as a norm in our community? Can you envision people being drawn to the love and power of God because of the clear witness of Christians fully committed to Jesus Christ? So what does that mean in your context, in your 30,000 member <laughs> congregation? What, what work are you doing that looks like this or not like this? Well, <laughs> well you know, I could go down the list of, of our feeding program, our, our uh, uh, ministry to prison inmates, uh, our program for uh, domestic violence, educating uh, men and women about the issue of domestic violence. I mean, I can go through the list mm -hmm. of our program, but the program has become a vehicle through which we build relationships because you can't minister to people. You, you know, uh, 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 relationship precedes ministry. So for us, we understand it's about building relationship with the community. And then as those relationships are strengthened, we can speak into their lives and talk about shalom. Because you just can't 
impose that on anyone mm -hmm. because they don't realize that they're broken. They don't realize that they're suffering from an inability to love. And yet we now, in the love of God, bringing that love, we've got to build a relationship so we can speak into their lives. Mm -hmm. Michael. I, I am in total agreement. We can't impose people to say, okay, you be nice to one another, love each other. Um, we're encouraged to be salt and light into our communities. Um, so we need to be salty people. And the only way you're going to um, um, spread that saltiness is to actually rub shoulders with other people, um, to add a flavor of the presence of God into their lives and their communities and their experiences. Um, programs are venues by which we can establish relationships, by which we can demonstrate the love of God to one another and to the community at large. It's going out into the community it's her, having permeable walls. So it isn't something that we hold ourselves to. I mean, certainly we can hold our little candle, and that the little song says we don't put it under the bushel, but we bring it out. And I think if I bring my little light, bring it with AR's light and your light and everyone is here, then we have a beacon of hope that we can infuse into the community and where, like malls, they would gravitate towards because it is something natural, desire, desirous of what they are lacking in their own life. Great. Well, CCDA's own Bob Lupton writes about how maybe we ought to spend less time in the church and more time as active neighbors. I guess I resonate with that quite a bit, maybe because largely most of my work in community development has been in the secular environment, even though I found the world of community development through CCDA and its authors and, and folks involved with CCDA. And my personal perspective has always been formed by Christian principles, especially as they're artic articulated by CCDA. Um, in my context, various of my community development colleagues have commented that in their church experience, they were taught that you either loved your community and your culture or you loved Christ. Mm -hmm. But those things didn't actually go together. Mm -hmm. um, and so they've been confused by me as they've watched me be a Christ Christian witness through my lifestyle and working alongside them on policy campaigns and secular community organizing and development efforts. But some would say that the work just has to be church-based. Meanwhile, in my context, as some of the walls of resentment against the church have slowly come down because of some of the Christians that have been involved in the work. Our local pastors who have been invited to sit at the table are often too busy doing their important church work um, to really sit down at the leadership tables as, that are part of our neighborhood power structure. Um, so where is the balance? Who would like to start? <laughs> Come out of the church, they are. <laughs> well, it goes back to, to, to the notion that, you know, the, the church preached separation, which is, is important to insulate us from that world so that we don't fall prey to its value system. Uh, but the preaching of separation became a practice of isolation. So the church became this elitist group that really concentrated on building within its four walls and its lost relationship with uh, the community it serves. So it created an antagonistic relationship between community. I mean, that's, that's the reality that we experience in, in, in New York City in the police department. So it's not just the church. Because in the 1960s, when I was growing up, you know, the, the, the police officer walked the beat. He knew your parents, everybody knew each other, and when the climate of things, the social climate became very uh, hostile towards law enforcement, they took the cop off the street, put him in a squad car, gave him a shotgun, and he began to drive around the neighborhoods. Now that sends a message of, you know, you're, them and us. And here it is years later, and, and, and I'm doing for the New York City Police Department cultural sensitivity training. Hmm because there's this gap between the two. Well, the same thing with the church. If the church withdraws and we're in our four walls building our kingdom and don't understand our responsibility and our prophetic voice that we are to speak words of justice to hold a society accountable in which we live for the poor and the voiceless, then the people out there will see a disconnect mm. and we lose our authority over their lives. So it, it goes back to, to uh, changing the way we look at society, changing our lens with regard to Christ uh, in the culture. You know, that's, that's my orientation. Uh, above, counter, you know, we can go through all of the Christ and culture that Niebuhr talked about, but 
For me, it's the dynamic, transforming power of the gospel in the presence of God in society. So I don't necessarily have to sit in the seat of power, but if I have a relationship that is very deep and profound with the individual sitting in that seat, then through that platform, I begin to impact the very culture and society mm. over which that individual exercises power. And they may not be Christian. Right. Well, you think, you're talking, I think, small c, institutional, um, religious um, expression. Uh, I look at it the big C. We are the church, as you said. We are to be part of the community. We are in the world. We are the, the called out ones, the ecclesia. So in terms of church, yes, we are the body of Christ incarnate. That can only be lived out lived out in a public way. It is not, again, a private kind of endeavor, ultimately, but something that is seen, um, that experienced, that can be savored, um, and hopefully gives us that hope that would lead us to that shalom we've been talking about. Great. Well, as Christian community development, developers focused in specific under-resourced communities, it might be very easy for us to take all this learning and apply it to a very narrow geographic locale, our neighborhood, our city. Um, and sometimes we're too busy to work on issues of stewardship, such as taking care of the environment, caring for all of God's creation, until it becomes a crisis issue, like many of us have figured out now. Um, so what is our responsibility to address national and global shalom, and what might that look like? Michael? Well, I think it goes back to what A.R. says. It's, it's a journey. Um, where we, in, in the process of changing and transforming our immediate context, we find ourselves part of a global village. We no longer are isolated from what is happening in the world today. I mean, technology has really shrunk this planet in such a way that what impacts us today in terms of what we eat and what we wear it's certainly connected to something larger than who we are. And so the very acts of shalom, may that be in terms of how I conduct myself and my resources, how I tend to the earth in my backyard that feeds me, um, to how I greet the server at the restaurant. It is, I think, a global um, effort uh, where we experience shalom immediately, but at the same time, because of those relationships, is transcendent. That individual, let's say that server at that restaurant, has family elsewhere who he or she connects with on a probably weekly basis, sends money back to um, them, and helps support them by being here in our shores. I think that it's no longer us and them, it is all of us. Um, Jürgen Moltmann, a German theologian who wrote Theology of Hope, so we can only experience the face of God in community. It is not a, an isolated individual um, experience, but something that we work at in a communal way. And I think that's why I quite often hearken back to the Old Testament. It is very much a, a process that I think it's, uh, for me, articulated in the African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. Amen. Amen. I, I have to ditto that because mm -hmm. um, we teach our congregation that uh, God said it's not good for man to be alone. Mm -hmm. We're social beings. We're relational. He said if you're at the altar uh, presenting your gift and there remember that there's an issue with a brother, leave your gift at the altar and go re be reconciled. Mm -hmm. So relationship becomes more important than, than, than gift or religion, or expression with God, relationship within the context of community. And you don't grow in isolation. You can only grow in community. It's true of an individual. It's true of, of a church. Uh, additionally, uh, we, we understand at Christian Cultural Center that you have to address both the physical expression of, of the community and its spiritual expression. Um, Jesus talked about in, in Matthew 12, about the evil spirit being cast out. And I don't want to get uh, demonic and spooky here. But, um, you know, he talked about the evil spirit being cast out of the individual. Uh, it, 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 you know, it goes and searching for another place of rest and, and finding none, it comes back. 
but finding the individual out of which it was cast uh, clean, swept, but empty. And then he says in the end of that passage, verse 45, he says, so it is with this generation. So too often we think that that passage relates to, you know, demonic possession, all that kind of, but he's talking about the spiritual, uh, uh, <coughs> the spirituality of an individual and an entire generation. So consider a community. So we can get involved in, that's what's so beautiful about Christian community development, because we understand it's not about just building new homes and, and, and creating a clean and wonderful landscape environment, mm. but you also have to deal with the spirituality of the people who are going to occupy those new homes. Otherwise, after the ribbon cutting, six, seven years from now, mm. all right, we have exactly what Jesus said. That same spirituality re-enters and takes it back, not to where it was before we revitalized the community, but to a worse state. Mm. And I believe if we don't understand that, and we should as Christians, because we're seeing the spirituality of what we do as well as the physical expression, then we miss it. Yes. Amen. Feel free. Clap. Right. Take a minute. Yeah. And do feel free to jump in back and forth if you just need to say something about what the other just said. So, amen. amen. She wants a vibrant right. yeah. Yeah. conversation yeah. Yeah. here. Okay. All right. So we're only a couple of weeks away from a historic presidential election. Can't avoid the subject right now. Um, but even between big national elections, there's lots of local politics and power struggles that impact our ability to foster shalom in our communities. So what about politics? What does shalom mean for that? How do we engage the powers? What is our role? Well, politics, as we understand it, is really the uh, process by which groups of people make decisions. And, and that means ultimately, in, in practical terms, social relationships that involve power. Um, so we cannot get away from that. Um, we could try to isolate ourselves. We become irrelevant at that point, and unfortunately many of our um, communities have become irrelevant. Um, so we need to move into understanding of, with, with, I think with wisdom, with, um, with the power of the spirit, to what we do, need to do to rectify uh, what has transpired. I mean, the people in Babylon, um, had to engage the politics of that city in order to get the resources to build the houses, mm -hmm. to tend the gardens, um, to understand how they're going to have an impact in the well-being of that community. So to shy away from that then really limits our ability to impact the world in our immediate community. And so politics, my understanding of it, is a prophetic endeavor to tell the truth, to tell the truth. And unfortunately, we all know what happened to the prophets. But that is something that I think is, is what is um, energizing, um, threatening, and certainly not boring, but we, we move into it with our eyes wide open and prayerfully. Because um, as we've seen, politics can be very uh, muddled in terms of how they see one another and what the issues are. But mm -hmm. I don't think we can ignore that. I mean, Isaiah 65 was very clear. If we want children to be born healthy, then we need to make sure that there's policies that would allow for that. Or for our seniors who have given their lives to the well-being of their families and communities to grow into the uh, age of, you know, of where we can honor them. That needs to be in terms of developing certain policies. Uh, we can just go on and on, but I, I think it was very clear that those things that we see expressed in Scripture can only happen by, by us engaging the processes and systems. It's interesting as we talk about shalom as peace, peace of shalom and wholeness, because the Apostle Paul said that, that uh, we should pray for those in authority, mm -hmm. pray for kings, pray for those in power, that we may lead peaceable mm. or whole, complete lives. So we cannot have that command and think that we're somehow disconnected from what's going on politically. Politics is power. Who has it? How'd they get it? How are they using it? Who's holding them accountable? And the church, I believe, has taken on the, the, the role of Jesus in 
terms of being prophet, priest, and king. And as king, the church has responsibility. In its kingly role, it has a responsibility to hold the institutions and systems of power accountable for their responsibility to enable and empower the citizens to live a peaceful, a whole life on the planet. So when we see government begin to uh, become self-serving, then the church has a responsibility to, to, to speak up. There's a wonderful passage in Proverbs 13, 23, and it says, there is uh, abundant food in the fallow ground of the poor. And fallow means uncultivated, which means there's potential there. there, there there's empowerment there. But it's left uncultivated, untapped potential. And the passage continues to say, an injustice sweeps it away. So justice is connected to the potential that's inside of every individual. And you will think that if, if we understand that there is that potential in the side, uh, uh, in the fallow ground, uncultivated of the, uh, uh, ground of the poor, we'll make sure that we do everything we can to cultivate it. So we don't have to feed them, but empower them to feed themselves. And that's, that comes out of the Bible. I mean, you know, that's, that's where we live. That's right. Christ in the culture. I think there's a fundamental shift there, too, you just expressed. Uh, and one, once again, underscore, we're talking big C, that it's not just the institutional ecclesial structure we're talking about, but also the house churches that we find, the incarnational uh, communities that are being formed. But the movement from serving people which sometimes just keeps them in survival mode into an empowerment experience which, where people can fully thrive. That, that's a, we need to be very clear about that, that justice isn't about just getting along, but it's really the fullness of life. Yeah, yeah. And I, I like that word empowerment because when you, you know, and, and, and again in that passage in Proverbs, you know, the, the uh, injustice sweeps it away. Uh, and the word sweeps there is, is like peeling away layer by layer. So injustice, which is meted out through policies that are directed towards stripping the poor of that potential, is problematic. And the church has a responsibility to speak up, speak up against it. Too often in our society, you know, right and left, I like what was said earlier, that the church is trying to decide right or left, when really we should be looking at the issues and have a, a biblical base to determine, okay, how are they responding to the church's responsibility? Which candidate is going to meet out those responsibilities? And who can we indeed uh, trust with that power? Right. We've got to think in those terms and not put God in a political party. And there's no other institution, or organization, or body of people who can hold our society accountable. We have the moral authority in terms of who we believe and who we claim to be. And so we need to be speaking the truth in all aspects of our lives, not just one part of it or isolated or bifurcated kind of in, in how we experience our lives. But it's not going to be government speaking it to itself. It's not the business community. Hello, what has happened? You know, our education system needs to struggle. The only um, body of people who can speak to this truth is us. And, yeah, and it's a moral authority. Yeah. I mean, that... That, that really says it. When Dr. King uh, tried to uh, deal early on with the issue of, of racism, it was quite a struggle in the beginning. But then he began to put it on a moral platform. He began to say it's morally wrong. And in, that, in doing that, he appealed to the conscience of this nation and held them accountable and challenged them. Mm. And he created a platform of moral authority that they had to respond to. And that's the church's greatest authority. It is our moral authority. Paul said it in Romans. He said, you who, 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 you who, commit a, who, who, you who teach don't commit adultery. Do you? You who mm -hmm. teach don't steal. Do you? Mm -hmm. He said, by your very actions, inconsistent with what you represent, you cause the world to blaspheme against God. So it's our walking integrity and strengthening our moral authority that holds the world accountable for what they do. Yes. Okay, so I want to go back to your concept of hold, being held captive and seeking shalom in the context of being held captive. Yes. And I want to ask, is the church in America in a situation of captivity? Or as some would argue, is the church so connected to the empire that we're really not 
in captivity? Mm, good question. I'm glad I'm just asking the questions. Yeah. I don't have to answer them. Next. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if I go back to, again, the Jeremiah passage, um, the rude awakening they had that they were themselves complicit in some fashion to what they've allowed to transpire. Um, certainly they were limited because that wasn't their, their, their place, their country. Um, they were, you know, lifted, taken away to where they didn't want to be. Uh, in some ways, um, I would say uh, our culture is held cop captive. Um, if we're talking about the urban context, we are driven by consumption, uh, certain kind of ideals. Um, and so then often what I find is that faith is trumped by culture, by which that which is um, um, articulated, communicated on a daily basis by turning on the television or listening to talk radio if you really want to spend your time there. Um, and so to break away from that is sometimes hard because we're really going after an illusion sometimes called the American dream. Um, and so that is what we are held captive quite often as a culture that needs to be redeemed. And I, I like what, how you call yours, the Christian cultural center. You know, there is redemption that God brings through divine shalom. And until that is experienced, I believe, yes, we are captives, always in this journey of finding shalom. Um, and I want to be hopeful. I really do. And maybe after November 4th or 8th or whatever, <laughs> I may be a little bit more hope-filled. I, I, think, I think also the, the whole idea of building houses, planting gardens, marrying children, I think what it says is that the culture and the climate does not prohibit the power of God's people from thriving, yes. whether in chaos, and Babylon represents chaos, thriving in captivity, thriving in chaos. That's what we do. And what better voice than Jeremiah, who in the very beginning of his own prophetic launching saw only his his inadequacies and his inability to measure up to that calling. Mm. And God reminds him, look, before you were born, I had a plan for you. I knew you. I formed you and shaped you. And he is now, out of that experience, speaking to a people, telling them by verse 11, mm. I know the plans I have for you, to do you good, not evil, to give you an expected end. So he's taking that personal empowerment that he experienced through that understanding that, 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 uh, God, God in him elevated him above his own weak, sense of weakness and, and, and frailty. And now he's empowering these people in captivity and saying, you can do this in spite of your surroundings. Yes. And thank God he did because it was in captivity that we had the greatest passing down of, of scripture to us. Because it was in captivity that we, we really saw Israel rise to the occasion of trust in their God and the prophetic notion that deliverer, deliverance would come to them. So it is in that context that we now benefit mm -hmm. and understand that same strength and empowerment. Well, you give me hope for Hallelujah. the church then. You give me hope for it, that even in the church's <laughs> captivity, they could find this sense of liberation yeah. and justice. But they, I think there needs to be a time of lament and, and true sorrow for how we have supported the structures that have brought to bear the suffering of children, the aged, and those that work hard, and those who, for whatever reason, don't have the right papers in their pocket. We need to speak to that reality and that truth. Okay. Amen. So as we head towards the end of our time here, I, I want to go back to my own journey that I talked about, my own kind of personal burnout experience, how in the midst of all of this work that you do, and you know, we've talked about hope and what are some of those things that give us hope, but what is, what are your own reflections on, on personal shalom and just really bring it home to a personal level? This is no problem, you know, everything's well balanced in your life, you don't have to think about personal shalom very often. We will have some workshops tomorrow <laughs> on, on this, but I look forward to being at some of them. Well, occasional massage, a little brinking out the, the body does help a little bit. Um, 
I think for me, and taking it on a personal basis, is understanding who I am in God. Um, um, being honest about that. Um, be, you know, I don't pretend to have a balanced life, but I love my life. I love what God is giving me. I love the, um, the kind of energy and passion I have to, des- to, to want to see uh, the divine presence lived out daily. Um, in the midst of pain and struggle, I am affirmed. Um, mo- many of you may have heard about the gen- homeless gentleman that was burned alive in my neighborhood. Um, I, you know, here it is, the person, the most marginal, captive by his own mental illness, unable to break out of that. His family felt he was abandoned by society. No one wanted him. In his memorial service, over 300 people showed up, and they said that John is one of us, and we have been part of his life. That gives me hope. That gives me a sense of, yes, I might be struggling every day, but it's more than just about me, right? Though I want to believe it's about me, but it's more about me. It's more than me, and it's more that struggle that I know. The more I struggle, the more I I believe that God is with me. Mm-hmm. That God is going to take me to that promised land. That I'm going to, and I'm going to want, I want to take as many people as I can with me. And so it's that energy and passion that keeps me going. Though I need to remind, be reminded, eat well, exercise, find your place, find that centeredness. But I, I think I thrive in chaos. <laughs> I can relate to that. I think, I think it's important that we... That we, that we uh, carefully wean ourselves off of the prednisone that is presented by this culture. And by what I mean by that, you know, prednisone is a drug that, that becomes a panacea for everything, but it gives a false sense of well-being. And this culture and its consumerism that feeds a radical individualism that has taken over even the church, yes. that's prednisone. That's a false sense of well-being. It's a lie that many are suffering and losing their homes about even as we speak. Mm -hmm. So the church has to get back to that fearless sense of brokenness, that fearless sense of, hey, I can do all things, but it's through Christ which strengthens me. So it brings our feet back on the ground, and and, and we, we gain a better understanding of why God let the thorn stay there and, mm-hmm. and not pull it out of Paul yeah. uh, flesh as his side uh, because his strength is made perfect in our weakness but we live in a society where no it's about I'm strong I'm, I'm, I, I'm Superman mm-hmm. I can do all the possible and yet it's when we find that place of broken submission before yes. God and emptiness of our own strength and power and knowledge that he comes in and does some incredible things I think we need to get back to that When Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? He wasn't talking to the multitudes. He was talking to his staff. So God's staff needs to relearn that lesson and understand what true wealth and power and what true measure of our spirituality is. And it's not in things. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd like to just invite each of you to give us some closing thoughts, something you really wanted to say and I didn't give you the the open door to say it or something you want to disagree with or just leave us, leave us with? Well, it's, I think it's more on a personal basis of why I believe in Shalom. Um, when I first arrived in Los Angeles, I was um, thrown by the experience of young people who at age 15 were already planning their funeral. Um, because they didn't believe they were going to live beyond 20 years of age. And yet I see in, read in Jer- Zechariah, you know, children, boys and girls playing in city streets. So in other words, they weren't throwing themselves in front of vehicles, or they weren't throwing themselves in front of something that would, would bring, you know, early death to them. Um, and it meant that we had to take time, and it is a journey, the building a house takes time, unless you're part of Habitat for Humanity or something of that nature. Um, you know, and it takes a little longer to convert it into a home, right? Um, you know, too much miracle grow can kill the garden. 
Uh, so it, it, it is a journey, but the journey is worth it. Because when the young people came to me and said, Michael, you know, um, we know how to get money. That's not the problem. We want to be able to earn it. We want a sense of dignity. We want a sense of future. Then I knew things had changed. Um, was it me? No. But it, we created a context in which shalom could be lived out on a daily basis. And once they experienced it, I think that's when they just said, there's a lot more to what you know, we thought. Um, I think that's life-giving. So, yes, in this chaos that can be overwhelming at times, it is that hope that shalom will triumph at the end of the day. Um, Amen. Those that hunger and thirst after justice. What does it say? They shall be satisfied. We shall that's be right. satisfied. That's right. That's right. Amen. 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 I'd like to say keep coming and supporting CCDA, <laughs> number one. Number two, I think we need to stop saying, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, yet we are terrified to get involved with that world mm. that we claim a greater power over. Yeah. Because I believe that when God, when we stand before God, he's going to ask us, what did you do with all the authority, power, influence, relationships, and gifting that I gave you? What did you do with it to change that fallen world that I left you in after you got saved? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't express you to heaven. There must be a reason why he left us here. And best we figure that out and do something with it. Amen. Thank you. Right. Amen. Well, what better words uh, to end us with? Let me just add to that the last paragraph on this page about Shalom. CCDA exists to see this kind of impact in the poorest communities in our nation and world. Our passion and commitment is to be a voice of challenge equipping Christ followers who are ready to step forward and see the shalom of God become a reality in under-resourced communities. To this end, we pray boldly and confidently as Jesus prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Great. Good work.